That was a great night, and as I was just telling the communion venue, I particularly enjoyed getting to be part of it. So grateful for the staff that uh, God has given us in our youth ministry, and getting to read those letters to each of my boys was, was a special moment as well. Glad that you're here. Welcome. You made it. You turned your clocks forward, and... Uh, you survived coronavirus for another week, and here we are. So uh, let's continue on in the series that we started last week. We're calling it, Who is Jesus? And you can turn in your Bible, and we're going to go to Mark chapter 2. If you need a Bible, you can wave at one of the ushers. They'll be glad to let you have one of those Bibles uh, to use today or to keep if you need. The interesting thing that you're going to see as we go through the Bible, uh, through the book of Mark is that, well, you know how it is, uh, haven't you ever got, gone through the airport and you're walking down the terminal and you hear this beep, 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 and invariably it's one of those carts that, that they have some people on. I keep waiting for them to stop and invite me to join, but they don't ever pick me up. The, anyhow, the driver always says, excuse us, excuse us, you know, and they, what do those carts do? They tend to go right down the middle. And so the crowd just sort of has to move to one side or the other. And we're going to see as we go through the Gospel of Mark, that's exactly what Jesus does. He goes beep right down the middle. And he's going to force people to make a choice. We're going to see that starting uh, today in chapter 2. Uh, but let's back up and remember where we were in chapter one last week. We remember last uh, week, Steve Carter did a marvelous job orienting us or introducing us in chapter one to Jesus, this very different, unconventional, revolutionary sort of rabbi. Everybody knew in those days, if you wanted to be a rabbi, the way that you became a rabbi uh, or, or, or the, the way that you could become a follower of a rabbi is that you went to that rabbi after years and years of Hebrew school and you asked the rabbi that you wanted to be a disciple of, could I follow you? And he would test you and make sure you really paid attention in all your Hebrew school. And if you knew all the answers, he would say, you can follow me. But if you didn't get them all right, he might very well say, mm, sorry, thanks for playing, but you don't get to follow me. Jesus comes along, though, and he's altogether different. He says, no quizzing, no testing. I'm coming and I'm saying, I'm opening up the door. Anybody can follow me. It's wide open. You're welcome. Come in. And this was altogether different. This new rabbi, this new way that Jesus was doing things. He's picking up not the cream of the crop, but the riffraff. He's getting the day laborers, people who were like fishermen who'd flunked out of Hebrew school years ago. He's taking the lowlifes like tax collectors. He's saying, yeah, even you. Don't you know that those guys knew what it felt like to be the guy that didn't get picked on the team at P.E.? or at recess, because that's what all of his disciples had felt until Jesus came along, and he said, I want you. I'm actually inviting you. Come follow me. So chapter one is an exciting chapter. People are starting to follow. Crowds are starting to form. What's not to like about Jesus? He's doing miracles. There's some healings that start to happen, and people were excited and happy, but then take, things take a decisive turn in chapter two of Mark. And many people sail right through this passage that we're going to look at, and they miss this. But you and I, we're not going to miss it. We're going to see it with our own two eyes today, and we're going to learn something from it. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1, let me read to you. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the man, uh, lowered the mat, lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, 
Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. And he got up and he took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everybody and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. So the scene starts at somebody's house. We don't know exactly whose home they're at, but already the crowds have formed. They flocked to Jesus, spilling out through the front door into the front lawn, S-R-O crowd again for Jesus. And then from way down the road, you turn and you see these four men and they're coming along, huffing and puffing, and they're carrying this man who is on a mat, a fifth guy. We'll call his name Pete just to have a name. And they're bringing old Pete to Jesus. Why? Because they've heard not only is he a revolutionary sort of rabbi, not only does he have profound teachings, but he also is a healing. He's a miracle worker. And so by the time they get all the way up to the front lawn of the house, they're trying to, to sort of get in to Jesus, but they can't get in because it's shoulder to shoulder. You picture the men setting Pete down on the mat Maybe one of them goes up and nudges some of the crowd and and says, excuse me. And maybe some of the crowd go, shh, we're trying to listen to him. It's hard enough to hear. Stop talking. Well, we we, want to hear too. Don't you think that's what everybody wants as well? Be quiet. Maybe the guy bringing the mat said, "Uh, (laughs) we got a problem. (laughs) See Pete here? At which point, very well. The crowd might have turned and said, we all got problems. That's why we're here. Didn't take long for the four men to realize, okay, there ain't any cutting. We're not going to be going through that way. But we've got to get Pete to Jesus because he's paralyzed. It's about then that one of them looked up and noticed the roof. Nobody's on the roof. And all of the Middle Eastern homes had stairwells that went up the side of the house. And all the roofs were very similar in this. They had big logs, beams that went across and then thatch that was packed down the other way with earth and tile put down so that it would keep the rain off. And roofs were made heartily because in those hot, scorching Middle Eastern summer days, people would go up to their roof to get some cool in the heat of the day. They sometimes would take their meals on their roofs. They sometimes would sleep all night on their roofs because it was so hot in those clay huts where they lived. So the roof could take it, and the four men, they knew it. So they grabbed Pete, and they started going up the stairs. And they started to dig out... Better Homes First, Skylight. (laughs) And don't you know that that was an interesting scene when Jesus is teaching inside the home and they hear some clamoring upstairs and then they see some little debris that starts to fall in because how could it not fall in? And don't you know that Jesus was teaching along and before long he realized I'm losing my crowd because everybody's eyes are looking upward. I sometimes feel that way, especially when it rains. If it rains very hard, especially if it rains over where communion venue is. In Central Court East, I think they have a real metal roof on that side. And it just, and I just watch everybody's eyes go like this. And I want to say, there's nothing to see. There's no windows up there, but you're not going to get wet. Focus, focus. I suspect Jesus was probably feeling a little bit like that at just this point. And about that time, the hole is big enough, and they drop Pete down just at his feet. I bet that was a really interesting moment. 
I remember when I lucked into getting to go to Super Bowl 51 here in Houston at NRG Stadium several years ago. And it came time for uh, halftime, and it was going to be Lady Gaga. And, and you always wonder how they're going to come in. She comes in on these cables from the roof. They're dropping her. I'm like, man, that is a long distance. Well, Pete, now, he didn't have to go quite that distance. It was probably more like 8 or 10 or 12 feet. But I guarantee you this, they'd never seen an entrance like that before when they were hearing a sermon from Jesus. And you know that Jesus' heart is already touched because of the way that he responds. What does he say? First thing he says, son. Another translation puts it, child. It's a term of endearment that wraps love and compassion all into one word, child or son. And then he says an interesting thing in 8b. He says, your sins are forgiven. And don't you know, the people who were peering over from the roof in the hole that they dug with expectant faces are saying, what did he just say? He said, His sins are forgiven. Can't they tell? We didn't just go pick him up at a strip club. It's not forgiveness that he needs. It's healing that he needs. He's paralyzed. That's the problem. Which begs the question, why do you suppose Jesus said, your sins are forgiven? Scholars suggest three reasons. The first was that people in that day and age, they worked with the worldview. And the worldview, pretty commonly held, was that if somebody had an infirmity, an ailment, certainly paralysis, there was an assumption, and that assumption is, boy, you must have had some sin back in your life somewhere. Somewhere you are sinning bad, and that's why you've got this problem today. So maybe Jesus was acquiescing and condescending to the worldview that he knew people were having. And so, well, okay, I'll start there. Maybe it's because Pete knew. I do have a sin problem. Maybe somehow roundaboutly, even as paralysis had been caused by sin. Maybe Jesus knew that, and maybe he was just saying your sins are forgiven because he knew that's at the deepest level what Pete needed. Maybe it was both of those things, but it was certainly a third thing as well. And that is, Jesus was going to make a statement in those words, your sins are forgiven. That's going to send a signal. That's going to send a shot across the bow for the teachers of the law that it says were sitting there. Of course they were sitting because they're VIPs. They always got the seats and they got to sit up front. They're probably sitting in rocker, you know, lazy boys feeling comfortable as they're, you know, watching this whole thing unfold. Jesus is engaging in an altogether different discourse It's sort of like a two-dimensional story we're reading. We're seeing the superficial, what's happening with Pete, but then there's there's this thing that's going on between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees at a different level. And you've got to make sure that you understand that because this is the first time you hear Jesus, beep, beep, beep. He's going to go right down the middle, and you're going to have to decide. Because in choosing to heal Pete that day by saying, your sins are forgiven, Jesus was saying something in no uncertain terms. He was saying, I'm God. Because the moment he said, your sins are forgiven, those scribes were thinking to themselves, the nerve of him. Who does he think he is? That's preposterous. That's anathema. You don't get to, you can't forgive somebody's sins. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew that's exactly the mindset that they were working with. He even knows he's, it's what they're thinking. And he calls them on it right there in 8b. He says, why are you thinking those things? At this point, they're like, "Ah, don't think anything. Just be blank. Just be, because he's even reading our minds. This is really weird. And so you see, 
in this moment, Jesus is triggering. He's making an announcement to all who will look and see it. It's this. Yes, scribes. Yes, Pharisees. Only God can forgive sins. Check. That is right. And yes, you just heard me say your sins are forgiven. Therefore, I am he. You're going to have to decide. Oh, you could conclude I'm crazy. Or you could conclude I'm just bluffing and making it up. Or maybe it's true. Maybe I really am the Messiah. So you see, this is all happening at a lower level, above the the scene that all of us are more familiar with. And to further confirm his deity, he's going to double down on those scribes at this point. And he draws a reference from Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, that's in the Old Testament, there was a prophet Daniel, and he was fond of using this term, the son of man, to speak of the Messiah, the Savior who was finally going to come someday. The son of man, the son of man. What does Jesus say? Look at verse 10. But I want you scribes, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I've got that authority. I'm the Son of Man. Yeah, I and the Father are one. He's going to get it even clearer, make it even more pronounced in the chapters ahead. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But this was the first shot that, was, uh, that went across the bow that day that Jesus was firing by forgiving the man. He's claiming to be the Lord of the universe. Now, we still got Pete. What about Pete? He's still like paralyzed. Thank you very much for the forgiveness. But what about that? Well, Jesus asks a simple question. Well, simple to him. (laughs) He says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? Well, for Jesus, either is simple. The scribes, are they're perplexed. They're like, "Uh, well, I guess it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because we can't verify that. I mean, we can't look in Pete's heart and see did it really happen? Did the little sin meter go down to zero? Did something just get transacted? We can't verify that. And it would be harder to, to say your sins are forgiven and then you don't come good with it. I mean, you take up your mat and walk. And if you can't come through with that, that's going to be revealing Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. And he says, yeah, and it's for that reason. I said, your sins are forgiven. Now you need evidence. You need proof that something really happened in his heart, right? Pete, I want you to take your mat, rise up, and walk. Verse 12 says, he did. He stood up and he walked out. And all the people are like, oh my gosh, we have never seen anything like this. Now, three things I want us to see in this text. The first one is this. Beep, beep, beep. Jesus doesn't give comfortable space on either side. He goes right down the middle and he says, I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I am the Lord of the universe. And I'm calling you to follow me. I am asking you, lay down your current life and follow after me. Now, you would think that'd be all that people needed, right? They'd be like, I think I will. I think I'm in. I'll just follow after you. But they didn't back then, and they don't still today. Why? Because of two other reasons. I guess it's two other groups. 
sort of like the cart in the airport. There's a group on this side, and then there's a group on this side. You see both of these groups in the text, and I'm going to illustrate to you, you see both of those groups yet today as well. On the one side, you have a group that is characterized by a lot of the people who were in the crowd that day. We know that Jesus could <clears throat> pack the house. He could draw a crowd pretty easily. Wherever he went, the people were going to come. Why? Because he was going to do something significant. He was going to teach profound things. He was going to heal people and do miracles and and sometimes he was going to pass out free fish and loaves and, and get you free lunch. And so, I mean, you're going to have thousands of people who will come and follow that person. Ah, but they won't really follow. They'll just attend the event. We know the reality that when Jesus got to talking about now, I want you to take up your cross and I want you to follow me. And birds of the air have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head at night, and it's going to be rough for you too if you follow me. That thinned the herd a whole lot, which means really on this side, you have a group of people who wanted to be nothing more than fans, fans that could be fair weather. If times are good and the team's winning and the food's you know, uh, uh, being passed out, I'm in. Count me in, Jesus, to be a follower? No, just to be a fan. I just want to take the benefits and the blessings that you're offering. But I, I don't really, like, I'm, I'm going to stay in this group. We know by the time that Jesus was crucified, there weren't many people still with him. There was a lot of fans, but when the going got tough, pew, they were gone. I see that today. I bet you see it as well today. People who in essence are saying, or maybe forthrightly are saying, Lord, I need a blessing. Just give me a blessing. Bring the blessing today. Do me a miracle, Lord. I just need a miracle today. Sometimes I'll even help Lord out. Lord, I just, I'm just praying for this ticket, this ticket to have the right number. The jackpot number, Lord, I'm just, that's just one thing. That's the only little thing. That's just one little prayer. Just, just come through with that, Lord, and I'll never ask another prayer again. This person treats the Lord sort of like a lucky charm or, or a talisman. The problem with this group is that if or when the Lord doesn't come through the way that the person was wanting, they conclude, well, I guess Jesus wasn't big enough or powerful enough or loving enough or something enough for me. I'm out. Really, when you boil it down, this is the group that mistakenly concludes Jesus is really just too small for me. He's just too small for me. There was a woman who came to talk several years ago. I said, well, what's on your mind? She says, well, I just need to talk with you about my faith because my faith is sagging. I think I've lost my faith. I don't know if I believe it. Oh, really? Well, tell me, why do you not believe anymore? Well, I don't believe anymore because last year my mother got cancer. My mother's my favorite person in the whole wide world. We were so close. And I prayed and I prayed. I even fasted. I just did everything I knew that a good Christian is supposed to do. I'm like, okay. She said, and would you believe my mother died? He just did not come through for me. I'm like, wow. I can see why you're down on your faith right now. And they said, but... You know, in my line of work, I bury a lot of people. Sooner or later, all of them, 100% of us check out. And so I just want you to consider this. If your faith, if everybody's faith was predicated upon the people that they love never dying, then nobody would ever cross the line of faith. Don't you realize the folly 
of that. You're acting like he's too small to help you, but maybe he's really quite big, and maybe he's working some plans together that you know not of. Maybe his ways are not our ways, but maybe we don't get to know exactly why certain things happen until we're on the other side. I didn't tell her, but I could have been tempted to say, you should have a talk with my friend Seth Martin. He's the guy who leads the mission, the road mission on our staff, get to sit at the lead team table with him every week. And there's a young man, Seth, who could tell you his own story of pain. Every bit as painful as yours, ma'am. I didn't say this, but I could have if I had taken a notion to. I've heard Seth tell the story. Maybe some of you have too. He was in a car years ago as a child sitting in the back with his little brother. They were driving, his parents were driving, and there's a torrential rainstorm. And Seth even said, I prayed silently, Lord, please protect us in this rainstorm. No sooner had he said that, said that prayer, a truck comes across the, the, the middle and smacks their car. And it's a horrible accident. And his mother, Seth's mother, has turned into a quadriplegic for the rest of her life. And his brother was killed. You hear him tell the story, and it's very, t- he'll be teary, you'll be teary. It's very, very touching. But I'll tell you what's particularly inspiring then. As he comes through the story, and then he says, But I had to wrestle with, well, who else do I have to follow? If not you, I don't understand why this happened. It doesn't make any sense according to my calculations. I see no good reason whatsoever, but I have to trust that you're good and that your ways are wondrous and that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes and that you have something in mind. And, And today, Seth, leads a thriving ministry here that sends the better part of 500 plus youth and adults out to different parts of the city and the nation and the world to do ministry and to tell the story of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. Now there's a person who could have very easily said, "Ah, I give up, God, he's just, Jesus is just too small for me. But he came after his suffering, to a very opposite conclusion. Now, I wonder, what about you? Jesus is going right down the middle. Beep, beep. He says, I'm the Messiah. But I know some people. Are you one of them? Who says, I I just, I don't really, I just, I just kind of want the nice stuff. But just the little favors, the blessings, the miracles, you know. If you don't come through, I'm out because he's not big enough for my needs. Then there's this other group. This is a group that I guess was characterized more by the scribes and the Pharisees. They were coming to an altogether different conclusion about Jesus. They were coming to the conclusion, wait a second, Jesus is too big for us. What kind of man is this? Good heavens, we can't control him. He's, he's forgiving people's sins. We, he doesn't fit into our box. It's like he's come to take over. Yes, he has come to take over, as a matter of fact. And they said, well, we're not, we, we do, that's, just, that's too much power. We're not, gonna, that's, we're not letting go of control. He's too big for us. They were concluding That's why we're not going to follow. Anybody can look into our hearts and know what we're thinking. Mm -mm. We're out. Reminds me of a guy that I was talking uh, to a while back. I guess the better part of a decade now. A wonderful man who I had met and and I asked him, uh, would you be in a discipleship group with me? Because I would like to help you become a stronger disciple of Jesus. I'll never forget his response. He said, now, Ken, I want you to know, I enjoy faith bridge and I believe faith is a good thing and a necessary thing to have. And 
And I want you to know I'm flattered you would ask me. And, and I'd like to be in a group with you. Uh, but I just want you to know going in, I, uh, I don't think I'm probably up for becoming a disciple of Jesus. I think the word scared him because he was afraid that maybe somehow I was going to take him in the back and work him over and turn him into an obnoxious Bible-beating fanatic who stood out on street corners and, 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 you know, as people drove by the intersections. Nothing could be further from the truth. He did finally acquiesce and says, okay, I'll be in the group. Years later, he is a strong disciple of Jesus. He's become a serious follower growing in his faith but at first it was it was scary to him because it seemed like Jesus was just a little too big or similarly another man who asked if we could talk and I said yeah so what what are we going to talk about he says well I just felt like I needed to meet with you because uh, you know I I love Faith Bridge I love the church and I love Jesus and love you you're great thank you so so what's the issue I just felt like I just needed to, to look in your eyes and, and, and say plainly, the way I see it, my body is my body. And now that I'm a single man again, if I meet a pretty woman and I want to be intimate with her, um, I'm going to seize that moment. And I just want to make sure that you know clearly so that you don't think that I'm being hypocritical. I said, well, I appreciate that you're so concerned about me, but I'll just be honest with you, sir. I don't really think uh, I'm the least of your concerns. I think the one that you're really intending to have this conversation with, but somehow you chose me as a proxy, is the Lord. Because you're bending over backwards to tell me you're following him, except when you're not. What was the problem? For this guy, the Lord and his word just seemed too big, just too much. I'm not going to do all of that because i got to have some control around here. And I'm going to be in control of this part of my life, by golly. And I meet a lot of people who say that same sort of thing. In essence, they're, they're like, they're saying, in essence, I, I, you know, look, I, little religion on Sundays, that's a nice thing. But I don't want to give up control in my life. I don't want to surrender my life over to somebody else's lordship or control. I don't want somebody else coming in and saying, I'll take over. But if you listen, you hear Jesus, beep, beep, beep. That's who I am. Say, well, that that costs so much. I just, I like my life. I like being in charge. And if I want to stray a little bit here and there, I want to to be able to put my hands on the, the wheel and do that. Well, let me just ask you something. Instead of looking solely at the costs, which are real, we do surrender our lives in following uh, Jesus wholeheartedly. We do have to give up control. We do have to acquiesce and say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. I belong to you. But let me ask you this. Have you not considered the benefits? Have you not considered what he's come to offer He offers you life, abundant on this side of eternity and eternal and everlasting on the other side. He offers to come and to pay the price that you couldn't pay by dying on the cross for you after living the life of sinlessness that you couldn't live and thus You deserve punishment, but he says, I'll take the hit for you. And then on the third day, he conquered the grave that you would never be able to conquer. Is it really so much that you're giving up 
to receive him and to hand the reins of your life over to him in return. He says, I'm giving you not just a year or two of abundance, not just a decade or two, not just a hundred or two hundred years. I'm not talking even about thousands. I'm talking about millions of years. You're telling me, the Lord would say, you're telling me you want to hang on to control and go into a Christless eternity in 30 or 50 or 70 years if you should have that long? Because you got to hang on to the control when you could have surrendered and you could have chosen life that will last forever and ever with me? That's crazy. There's not a better deal out there. He proves it time and time again. He's good. He says, but you do have to choose. Beep, beep. You could take the superficial view and say, I just want it if it's convenient. I just want it if I get the blessings. You could resist and say, I don't want to let go of my control. I don't really want to give my trust to him. But again, look at his character. Ask yourself, is he not good? Tim Keller tells the touching story of a scene recorded in a National Geographic some years ago after the terrible fires in Yellowstone National Park. And the article talks about the park rangers who went into Yellowstone Park after the fires had died down. And there they saw on a charred stump a bird. It was an eerie scene. It was holding its posture protectively. Turns out it was a mother bird. And yet, by the time the rangers got to her, she'd been completely charred all the way through, just ashen. So one of the park rangers took a stick and he poked it. And that mother bird's carcass fell over. But underneath, out came three little live chicks. How was it that they were alive? The rangers realized the chicks had stayed alive because when the heat came, the mother did what the mother must do. She just sat there and she took the judgment. She took the heat. The fire came down on her. And when Jesus went to the cross for you and me, he looked down at people who were jeering and abandoning him, betraying him and denying him and mocking him. And the greatest act of love He stayed, and he took the heat for you and me. All of the wrath and the punishment that we deserved, he absorbed into himself. And then on the third day, he conquered the grave, which we'll get to at the end of our Lenten journey. But meanwhile, he says... If you've got a better offer than that, take it, but you won't find one. So come to me, follow me, give up that nonsense and give up that nonsense and follow hard after me because in me and only me, is life. And that's what I want to give to you, Jesus says. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the, um, the wonders of your grace. Thank you for coming, Jesus, into this world. Thank you for living the life that we couldn't live, dying the death we all deserved, conquering the grave we could never conquer. 
Thank you for how in this chapter you started making things clear. You started painting with bright colors. You started insisting. Now you have to choose. And we still have to choose today. My prayer, Lord, is even in this moment, people hearing my voice right now would say, I'm going to choose Jesus. I want to follow. And if that's you, friend, I just invite you in the quietness of this moment, you just open up your heart. You can just pray a prayer like this. I'll pray it aloud. You can pray silently if you want to borrow these words. Just say something like, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart. I need a Savior. I'm asking you to be my Savior. I'm asking you to cleanse me of my sins, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness, to fill me full of your Holy Spirit, to position me in front of all the world's potential that you created for me to live towards and to move forward towards. Won't you help me now to learn what it means to follow you and to do so all of my days. Many of us have said that sort of prayer somewhere along the way in the past, but perhaps even today on this second Sunday of Lent, you find yourself saying, you know, I think I've kind of been slipping. I think maybe I've been slipping a little bit into this group or maybe into that group. And in so doing, I've kind of been forsaking my Lord. Well, that's the purpose of the season of Lent to get in touch with our depravity, with our sinfulness, to get reacquainted with our Savior and to declare anew, I have decided I'm going to follow Jesus because he's my healer, he's my Lord, he's Redeemer, he's Savior, and he's King.